Welcome back. Glad you're here. You glad you're here? Yes. Amen. I'm glad you're here too. We want to have a good time with God tonight. We want to hear his word. We want God to speak to us. So let's begin with a word of prayer and pray in faith, believing that it's going to work. All right? Let's stand together. Father, we thank you for tonight. We thank you for the privilege of being in your house with your people, preparing to sing and hear the word. And God, we, we wouldn't want to take an opportunity and miss it to be able to say that we love you and you're an awesome God. And that we thank you for all you've done for us and what you've promised to do in the future. Keep us breath by breath, day by day. And God, help us to be able to give you the best that we have tonight so we can just rejoice and feel good about being with your people. So thank you for loving us, and we sure love you. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. and offer worship and praise and listen to messages that you have for us. We thank you for the offering we're about to collect, and we thank you for it being distributed where you want it to go in your loving name. Amen. Amen.
those offered. Heavenly Father, thank you for this offering and nurse it to our kingdom. Thank Amen. You, Jesus.
just the things that we say, but everything that we do. That we're to honor you and to lift you up and live a life that brings praise. And God, all of us have so many things to be thankful for. Things you've done in the past, things you're doing now, and things that we're not even aware of that you're going to do. So we just thank you for your promises. We praise you for your promises. And we just want, want you, God, to receive them and let our praise bring a smile to your face. Thank you for all your goodness. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. I'm sure glad that all of you came back tonight. Yeah. Are you glad that I came back? Yes. Yeah. Oh, good. Glad, David. All right, let me just give you this. Jimmy Brown, I called today to talk to uh, Fern to see how Jimmy was doing, and lo and behold, Jimmy answered the phone. And he's, he's better today. Uh, he said they were fixing to bring him some chicken soup. I won't tell you how he described it, but chicken soup. And, uh, they're going to run some tests tomorrow. And we just need to pray that these tests will come back good. They need to find out either that he's totally healed or that there's something going on there because, like I said, two weeks in a row, and he's tired of it. So pray for them. He did sound real good today. Uh, this morning when Jimmy came up to me and, and said what he did, I got so carried away with what he had said about the love thing that I forgot why he came up here. Jimmy's sister passed away this morning, and we're so sorry to hear that. I, I'm sorry. That's what he told me, and I just forgot to mention it, but so sorry. We'll be praying for you. Uh, we've got others that are traveling. We want to certainly remember them and pray they have good, safe trips back. So to all of you that's here, God bless you, and uh, God just keep us and supply all the needs that we have in our lives every day. Open your Bible to the book of Exodus, chapter 8. All right, verse 15 says, But when Pharaoh saw that there was respite, he hardened his heart and hearkened not unto them, just as the Lord said that he would do. And then look at verse 32. It says, And Pharaoh hardened his heart. At this time also neither would he let the people go. Why do people sin? You ever, 
ever, you ever just have one of those moments where you wonder? And rather than thinking about somebody when I say that, why do you and I sin personally? Why do we do it? Why does a person rob a bank nowadays when they know they're not going to get away with it? Why do they do that? When you, when you think about crazy things and you let your mind just work a little bit, you can come up with some crazy answers because there's never anything cut and dried. So I want us to look at this time in history and think about it. The children of Israel had been you can say in bondage, but I'm, I'm, I'm going to clarify that for you in a minute. I had Walter look up something for me several years ago, and he did. It says here, now, the sojourning of the children of Israel who dwelled in Egypt was 430 years. And it came to pass at the end of 430 years, even the selfsame day, it came to pass that all the hosts of the Lord went out from the land of Egypt. Now, if you read that like that, then we say they were in bondage 400, they were in Egypt 430 years in bondage. But then if you go back and you read God's word, God said, okay, you, you don't love me like you should because you're not keeping my commandments. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to let you be taken captive and you're going to remain in captivity 70 years. And then when you come out of captivity, you call me God then. You'll know me then. So if that be the case, where did 430 years come from? And of course, Walter found the answer. From the time of Abraham, when God called him and sent him forth to go and take his people to that land of Canaan, that land flowing with milk and honey, that promised land, to the time that the, the people of Egypt, the children of Israel, get out of the land of Egypt was 430 years. They weren't in Egyptian bondage but for those 70 years. But at the end of 430 years, now God appears, and God begins to talk to them, begins to dwell with them. So with that in mind, you have to remember they have suffered a long time, all of the children of Israel. They suffered a long time. God promised them certain things, but they, even though they got them, they sinned, and they were removed from them, and they had hardships, and a lot of problems come up in their life, but only because they didn't choose to serve God like he wanted them to. So here we find this story, and we begin to look at the children of or, or Pharaoh and the Egyptians. And we know that while the children of Israel were there, that there came a time when God came to Moses and said, Moses, I want you to go and set my people free. A lot of events had to happen. You remember the story of Moses. He jumped the gun. Then he had to go on the backside of a mountain for 40 years. Then God calls him back out to go over there and set the people free. You know all that story. But he says, I want you to go now, and I want you to set my people free. So after all the dispute goes on, Moses does exactly what God says, and he goes over there and faces Pharaoh. And God told him when he was there with the burning bush, God told Moses some things. He said, number one, I'm going to send you there, and you're going to tell them these words. He told him exactly what to say. Even though Moses wasn't going to say them, Aaron was, he still told Moses. He said, I want you to tell Aaron. Tell him what's going to happen. And I want you to tell Pharaoh to let my people go. And he said, by the way, he's not going to do it. But he said, that's okay. I've got a plan worked out where eventually he will do it, but he's not going to do it to begin with. There's going to be some things that's got to happen for me to get his attention. So you just keep telling him. He said, in fact, I'm going to send some bad things. I'm going to send what God calls plagues. And each one can be different, and each one's going to affect Pharaoh's heart in a different way, and I'm going to affect Pharaoh's heart in a different way until eventually he's going to say, take my people out of there. 
but he's not going to mean it. But that's all right. I'm still going to be there, and I'm still going to be God, and we'll just do something else. So there's where the story is. And now we begin to look at it, and you ask yourself the question, what was the purpose of all the plagues that was placed upon the Egyptians? What was the purpose of them? And I bet that, you know, if you think about it, <clears throat> you've got a very simple answer to get Pharaoh's attention. And you know what? You'd be partially right. Not completely, but partially. Because God was dealing with Pharaoh. But God was also dealing with Moses, with the children of Israel. And believe it or not, God was dealing with me and you. All that many years ago, God was dealing with me and you. We were on his heart. So the plagues are brought, each one being some part different in some way or another. But it was to show the children of Israel hope while they were there in that bondage, to show Pharaoh the power of God, and to show the world that there was a God, and to show me and you God's power, because we need it today. You look at where we are. We're in bondage. We are. Why do you lock your doors? We're in bondage. And we have to realize it's real. And God is trying to set us free by showing us the power of his word. The plagues gave Israel hope and courage. Now, they had been in bondage 70 years. can't imagine what that would be like. But it got really bad. And there was a lot of them, but they had to labor. They had to work so hard. And God says, go tell Pharaoh to let them go. Think about what kind of a message that was sent to, to Moses. He didn't tell him how he was going to do it. He gave him maybe the same message he gave to Abraham, I'll take you to a land flowing with milk and honey. Perhaps let Moses know. But think, how do, how do you take that many people and keep them together? How do you keep them from fighting and fussing, rebelling, getting lost? How do, you, how do you do all that? Well, I've, I've heard estimates of million and more than that people that Moses was in charge of. How do you do that? You ever had anybody ask you, say, well, listen, how did Jesus talk to all those people at one time? How did they all hear him? He didn't have a microphone. And, of course, that makes sense to us. I mean, we have to have one to talk loud. How did he do it? The same thing with Moses. How did he direct a million people, if that's what it was, or millions of people? How, how did he get their attention and say to them, follow me? We're going home. How did he do that? How did he get all of them to agree to it? But he did because God was behind it. You see, whenever we're following God's will and God's way, he'll make it work if we'll trust him and just, just do it. So here we see him starting on that journey. It says, and God, I have seed... I have seen how my people are suffering as slaves in Egypt. God is talking. He says three words here. I've seen it. I've seen how my people are suffering. And I have heard them beg for my help because of the way they are being mistreated. And I feel sorry for them. Therefore, I have come down to rescue them from the Egyptians. Just as a side note, where are you in your life today? How bad are things? What's going on? In any part of your life? He said, I have seen what they're going through. I have heard them beg for help. And it's touched my heart. And I've come down to them. Every one of us need to remember that. I don't care how bad we are, how bad off we are, physically, spiritually, mentally, emotionally, it doesn't make any difference. God sees it. 
He sees it. He sees your situations. He hears you when you beg for mercy. Not just throw up a Hail Mary. When you get serious and you begin to reach out to God, he hears you. And it says as it makes him feel sorry for us. We don't necessarily picture God as someone feeling sorry, do we? I mean, he's God. But you remember a couple of weeks ago I told you he stood there in Bethany and looked down on Jerusalem and he wept. He wept at the tomb of Mo, uh, Lazarus. He has emotions. He has feelings. He says, I have like feelings like you do. I know what you're going through because I've been there. And he feels sorry for us. And then he came down to them. So how did God come down to the children of Israel? God sends answers to our prayers. And those answers to prayers are his way of coming down to us. He sends down the answers. They, did, they weren't saying, God, send these plagues and God, do this and God. They were begging for God to deliver them. We don't say, God, heal me and let it come by this doctor or that doctor. I hope we don't say that. God, you know, do this for me. Do it this way, this way. You know, we pray for God to touch our bodies and heal us. And when someone's suffering, we pray God deliver them from their pain and suffering. We don't tell them how. So in this case, they're pleading and begging for God to see them and help them somehow deliver us from bondage. God, get us out of this. And he sends Moses there with all of these answers, <clears throat> with all these plagues that's coming their way. Not only that, but he also sent the plagues there to soften Pharaoh's heart. Pharaoh was a hard man. God knew that. And he knew it was going to take something to get his attention. He was the man. He had an ego that was huge. And if you know anybody with a huge ego, it's hard to get in there to them because they think they have the answer to everything, that they know everything. You, you know people like that? <laughs> mm, don't call any names. But he says, you know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to work on Pharaoh too. And it says here, I promise, God says, I promise to lead them out of their troubles. I will give them a land rich with milk and honey where the Canaanites, Hittites, Amorites, Pezzarites, Hivites, and Jebusites now live. The leaders of Israel will listen to you, Moses. Then you must take them to the king of Egypt and say to them, The Lord God of the Hebrews has appeared to us. Let us walk three days into the desert where we can offer a sacrifice to him. But I know that the king of Egypt won't let you go unless something forces him to. So I will use my mighty power to perform the kinds of miracles and strike down the Egyptians, and then the king will send you away. So the Lord told Moses, he said, look, I'm going to do all this stuff, but they're not going to listen to you. They're not going to let you go. But here he says, I'm going to do certain things, and they will let you go. So it's not a contradiction in the story. What he says is, tell your people, tell the Israelites first that we're going to take them out of here. And you're going to take them to a land flowing with milk and honey. He, he says, go tell them. So we know that somehow Moses got the word out to all these people. He said, and then go to Pharaoh and tell Pharaoh that I said to let my people go. And he said, he's really not going to listen to you. But it's okay because he will listen to you. But he's not going to listen to you. But he will listen to you. See? Any of us that way? Yeah. Listen to you, but you don't hear? Yeah. Listen up here, don't listen in here. I know he's listening to you, but he's not listening to you. So I'll do another plague and he'll listen to you, but he won't listen to you. You see, this is what was going on. He was preparing Moses for it. So he did that. And he says, I'm, I'm going to make sure that they get the message one way or the other. So he, 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 he did it to help Pharaoh's heart get soft. Now the Bible says in there, you can, you can read it yourself, that God hardened Pharaoh's heart. That was always a troublesome thing, too, until I understood it. But it says he, he, he hardened Pharaoh's heart. But here he says, I'm sending the plagues to soften Pharaoh's heart. 
two different things, and both of them came true. The plagues would show the evils and the dangers of sin. How many of us, I guess that's maybe the wrong way, how many of us understand the evil and dangers of sin? Do you understand that if we understood the evil and the danger of sin, we wouldn't do it? Honestly, we wouldn't do it. But we don't understand it. We get accustomed to it, don't we? We hear, but we don't hear. We hear, but we don't hear. And the understanding comes from here. And then the understanding goes to our head and you know, begins to, to speak out. We don't, we don't understand it. We don't. We just do it. We know we serve a loving God who is quick and just to forgive us of our sins. His grace is enough. You see, we've been told all these things so long that that's going to cover us. So we're okay. So we go out and sin, and then after the, I turn the TV off tonight and I lay there in bed, I'll ask God to forgive my sins and all be well. Never considering that we may not wake up. Never considering that we may not live long enough for the TV program to go off because we've gotten used to it. And that's exactly what had happened to the Egyptians. They had been in sin for so long because their leaders were sinful that their hearts were hard. Pharaoh's heart was hard. God said, I can soften it. So he sent the plagues, though, to show them how bad, how evil sin was. He had to get their attention somehow. And the plagues were sent there to do that. To tell us, what about me and you? The things that happen to us here on this earth. Do you think that everything that happens on this earth is just because the devil hates us? That we get sick and have bad things happen to us because the devil hates us? He wants to destroy us? Well, that would be the easy way out. That's why we like to think that. It has nothing to do with me. It's because there's a devil and he hates me. Therefore, that's why I'm, I'm doing what I'm doing. No, it's not. Not always. See, God doesn't have to allow it. But why does God step in sometimes and allow things to happen to us, bad things? Like plagues. Of course, we're not talking about the plagues like that. But what about us? What about the things that have sickness and disease that we have, death in our families? Why does God allow that to happen? He could stop it. Is it because you and I need to be shown how evil and the penalty for sin? Is it that you and I need to understand that God has the power to zap and to do whatever he wants to do at any time and we better be ready because he's not playing a game? That when God says don't, he means don't? Do we need to be reminded of that sometimes? And the answer is yes. So we need to be very careful about blaming the devil for everything. He's a bad person. But he ain't always that bad. Sometimes it's us. Are y'all ready to go? Jesus. Y'all. Let me hurry on through so you won't sleep very long. All right, the plagues also were used to show that you don't play around with God. You don't play around with him. And sometimes it takes, my grandfather said, Dan, don't play that knife, you'll cut yourself. Oh, Papa, I got it, and then I ripped my finger open. And I couldn't run to Papa and ask him to kiss it and bandage it and all that kind of mess because I'd just done something he told me not to do. And that's how it happens a lot of times in our lives. God says, don't go there, don't do that, don't say that, don't, and we do it anyway because we're all right. And that Mack truck runs over us. And God, why didn't you protect me? Why didn't you listen to me? You see? So the plagues did that. So what God tells us is that we've got to humble ourselves before God. The Egyptians didn't do that, but he's telling me and you. That means we've got to put God first. In 1 Peter, he says, it's a terrible thing to fall into the hands of a living God. A terrible thing 
for God to have to bring judgment with his own hands in our lives. It's a horrible, terrible thing to fall into the hands. We got we to understand that. God loves us. He wants us to go to heaven. But he also wants us to live a Christian life here to be a witness to other people. We can only do that when we're holy and when we're pure. So we've got to learn to try to trust him somehow. He says, do it with your heart, your mind, your ways, your will. Everything about you, surrender to God. Just surrender it. Surrender your eyes. Can you help what your eyes look at? No. <laughs> you can't. Unless you're blind. But we can direct what goes from here into here. Can you direct what you hear? Because it's all around us. But we can direct what goes from here to here. See, we have to be careful with this stuff. I can handle it. No, you can't. No, you can't. God can through you. But no, we can't. Because if we could, we'd none sin, would we? <laughs> but we can't handle it. We get messed up with it. So we have to try to figure out another way to do it. He says, let everyone, young and old. Now, now when, when Moses goes to Pharaoh, his first thing was, I want you to let us go so we can go a three days journey into the desert and make an offering or worship God. Now, that's really, to us, that, hey, that's dumb. God said, I want you to go and set my people free and take them to a land that's full of milk and honey. Then he says, tell them I want you to let them go so they can go three days out into the desert and worship me. Now, as a pastor, I want you to understand what that means. It means when I give an altar call for you to come to the front, you can't sit in your, in your seat and pray. Hello? Oh, we're thinking about that one. <laughs> See, that, that's, that's what he, that's what, I mean, really. Why go into the desert? Couldn't they worship God there right where they were? I mean, just run down to the stadium, have a mass meeting and worship God, then go back to your house. You see, that's what we do. God says, I want you to go to this. I can do it right here, God. I don't have to go to the front. Or I can do this, God. I don't have to do it. That, that, give me my God said, I want you to go out to the, tell him I want you to go to the desert. Why three days journey? Why not one day? Why have I got to take a million people three days into the desert and then turn around and get them all back? Besides, they don't have porta johns. What are we going to feed them? Well, I mean, come on, God. Think of all the ramifications going on here. Three days journey. That's crazy. Why, why do that? And the answer is very simple. God said, tell them that's what you want to do, but they're not going to let you do it. Sometimes God has us say some crazy things. To us, it's crazy. I don't, I don't want somebody to quote me wrong. To us, it's crazy. But it's not. He has a plan. Hey, God, wait a minute. You want me to build a boat? How big? Where am I going to get the lumber from? What about the nails? You want me to hammer them all in by myself? Yeah, really, right. And what am I going to say when the people start laughing? Besides that, where am I going to put it? Yeah, all these thoughts that Noah might have had. God had a plan? How crazy of a thing has God ever told you that you laughed at? Sarah, you're going to have a baby. <laughs> you're right. <laughs> A lot of hundred-year-olds have babies. I mean, I'd just be one of them. <laughs> no, nah, she said, uh-uh, ain't going to happen. I'm too old. Listen, God has a plan. A plan. He tells us crazy things sometimes just to see if we're willing to be crazy enough to follow God. Tell him to take you, you want to go, and you want to go three, three days out to there and worship me. 
but he's not going to let you do it. So he told him, oh, and by the way, we're going to take our animals too. Really? <laughs> so your animals are going to worship too, huh? So he tells Pharaoh. And Pharaoh's heart, he finally says, okay, after a little persuasion there by God, he said, let everyone, young and old, go. This is what Moses said. We will even take our sheep and our goats and our cattle because we want to hold a celebration in honor of the Lord. And the only way we can have a celebration is to have our sheep and goat and camels. Okay? So we want them to go with us too. Oh, Pharaoh said, ain't no way. You can go, but leave the animals here. See, the world's always trying to bicker with God. Always. Don't we? You must let us offer sacrifices to the Lord our God, and we won't know which animals we're going to need until we get there. That's why we can't leave any of our animals here. Isn't that a crazy conversation? I'd have loved to have seen it. He said, no, we're go you, you can go, but you can't take your animals. He said, no, we're going to take our animals. And this went on, bickering back and forth. We got to learn somehow to trust God. Pharaoh's not going to let him do it. God's already told him that. God has a plan. This was a test run, three miles out and back. It's a test run because Moses would object to it. I thought we said we were going, now we're going to go there and come back. Pharaoh's going to object to it, but his heart's going to get harder. So the plagues start coming now. And the thing I love about the plagues is just simply this. One of my favorite verses I quoted for you the other day, though it tarry, wait for it. For though it tarry, it's not going to be a day late. Whatever God has for us in our life, it may not come when we want it to, when we expect it, when we think we need it the most. But don't give up on God because he's going to send it just like he said he would, and it won't be one day late. I love that verse. Well, here God is saying, He's going to allow his people to suffer if that's what it needs in order for his will to be accomplished. And it doesn't matter how long it takes. Ten plagues, it could have happened in one. But there had to be all of these things going on. God has a master plan. God, why have I suffered so long? God, you know I've done this. You know I've done that. You know this. You know, God, why? 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 And every time we ask that question that way, we're weakening our faith. Where we need to somehow rise up and say, God, I don't understand it. But I'll wait because I know you said the answer's on its way. I know that. Ten plagues they had to go through. But understand this. Have you ever wondered how long it took for those plagues to happen? I wish I'd asked Walter this one. How long did it take? What do you think the, the period of time was that from the first plague to the last one? From the time that he said, I want you to set them free, to the time that Pharaoh says, take them. You ever thought about it? See, we just assume, boom, 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 boom. There you go, 10 days. But the answer is it took months because it describes it in other places. It says it began before the harvest or before the planting season went way till after the harvest, the way it describes it. So it took months for these things to happen. And each one had a purpose. And God was trying to show them, just hang on. Think about the children of Israel. They've been told God's going to deliver them, and now all of a sudden all these things start happening all around them. Think of their thoughts, and God, how much longer? We get that way, but we need to wait on God. Then understand this about plagues. Understand this and listen to me. When God allows things to happen in mind in your life, 
is for a purpose. He loves us. The purpose is not to inflict pain here, but to help us to live so that we will not have pain then. Heaven is, hell is for eternity. The suffering here is only for a time. And God allows a time here so we can repent and not have to go to hell. He loves us that much. It's hard to see when we're going through this mess, but he loves us this much. But the catch is that as we go along in our, in our lives, if we continue in sin, the severity of the punishment increases. Now, I know that some of us are living in things right now that we say, it can't get any worse. How many times have we said that? It can't get any worse than this. And God's looking down at us. He says, oh, yeah, it can. Just hang on. So why would God allow the severity of what we're going through to get worse? And the answer is because of our own heart. If we wouldn't reject him, he'd stop it. Because all he's trying to do is to get our attention so that we'll repent of our sin and turn back to him. How far in that barrel of suffering do you and I choose to go? And the answer is it's different. If I can see the evil of my ways and I cry out to God, how far do you think, how far do you think Peter went under the water? In that movie I, I, I watched the other day, it showed him going under the water, and it showed the water covering it up, and it showed it as Jesus looking down at him. Of course, he could see him down there. How far do you think he went? Not very far, because you can't live long without oxygen, can you? Well, who was watching him? He could have gone a mile down without breathing, because God was in charge of that situation. He went down until Peter looked back up and saw Christ and did this. How far do you and I have to go before we, God help me? He doesn't want us to go way down there because it hurts. The farther down we go, it hurts. But he'll do it to get our attention. To get our attention. The severity gets worse. And that's exactly what happened with these plagues. They begin to get worse. Things begin to happen. It says that there first there came rivers was turned to blood. Then there came frogs and lice and flies and the livestock and the boils. Now, these were the first plagues. Look at it again. The frogs out there, the lice, the flies, the livestock died, and, and boils were on people. So as he began to look at these things and begin to think about them, these are the easy plagues. There's not one of those things there when you read this story and see how bad they were. Not one of those things easy. But they're defined as the bad, I mean, as the easy plagues in this whole thing. They were short. And then they were over. It's like the flies came in. Pharaoh said, take them away and we'll serve you. Flies gone. The boils came on people. Take them away and we'll serve you. They were gone. See, they were things that just happened out here, and they were very short-lived. So each time, it didn't loosen anybody's heart, didn't ease it up. All it did was, if I say this, then this is going to happen. If I say this, this is going to happen. And how many times do we do that? If I run to the altar, say some, say some fancy words, I can go back, and I'll be fine, and tomorrow I'll do what I want to. See, we play that same game with God, and they're called easy plagues, short-lived things that happen to us. Toothache, headache. Little things. And they get over with in a, quick, you know, in a hurry. And it doesn't get our attention every time. God hopes it would. But it doesn't every time. But then after them, those easy plagues, then came the hard ones. And God began to bring the severity of these things. And they got really, really bad. Things began to happen that really affected them mentally, physically, not so much spiritually at this point, but began to really affect them. Hail. When that hail came, it destroyed everything in its path. 
And we, we think about hell not being so bad because all we get is little tiny BBs of hell. But when they get big enough to start knocking holes in your vehicles and busting your house up and killing you, yeah, they get real bad. And I don't think God sent them little tiny things. I think he sent boulders because it began to tear every tree down, begin to tear their houses up, begin to kill what livestock had been, was left, begin to do everything around them. Hail was horrible, and they were terrified. Then the locusts came. The locusts ate everything in sight, ate every leaf off of every tree had been knocked down, ate every piece of grass. Can you imagine having a lush green yard and wake up the next day and it'd be nothing but dirt? They ate everything. Nothing for the animals to eat anymore. Nothing out there for them to, to, to harvest. Nothing. It was all gone. And then darkness. And you think darkness is a relief. No. Three days, pitch black dark. We can't stand it a few minutes at nighttime when electricity goes off, can we? Can you imagine walking around three days and never seeing the light? they begin to be terrified. We're talking about can't see in front of your face. There was no candles. There was, no, no, there was nothing. Total darkness. And then the death of that firstborn, the oldest child. Can you imagine the wailing, the crying? It must have been heard throughout Egypt that next morning. All those children dead. Pharaoh said, I think we got serious now. We got to talk. So he called Moses back in. During the night, the king sent for Moses and Aaron, and he told them, Get your people out of my country and leave us alone. Go and worship the Lord as you have asked. Take your sheep, your goats, your cattle, and get out of here. But ask your God to be kind to me. The Egyptians did everything they could to get the Israelites to leave their country as quickly as possible. And they said, please, hurry up and leave. If you don't, we're all going to be dead. Then again, they changed their mind. Then the king sent for Moses and Aaron and told them, now I have really sinned. <laughs> My people and I are guilty, and the Lord is right. We can't stand any more of this thunder and hail. Please. Ask the Lord to make it stop. Your people can go. You don't have to stay in Egypt any longer. Now, we look at that and we think, man, God did a good job, didn't he? They, they got it right. And the answer is no, they didn't. Think of the words they said. Ask God to take it away. Take your people and go. We've had enough. We don't want to die. But if you read that entire book, you won't find one place where they say, God, forgive us of our sin. They hated the pain. They hated the sorrow. They hated the torment. They pleaded, ask your God to heal us. Ask your God to help us. Ask your God to not one time did they say, ask your God to come to us because we've messed up. Even in the second verse, he said, we have sinned. We've done wrong. God is right. But you don't see him saying, so God, will you forgive me of my sins? Confe or saying that, God, that you're a sinner won't get forgiveness of sins. Admitting it won't make it right. It takes a broken and contrite heart to say, God, forgive me for I have sinned. And I'm going to tell you, church, as these plays got worse, so did their hearts. So did their hearts. What about me and you? When all these things that happen to us, do they draw us closer to God or take us farther apart? Do we get to the point where we want these things out of our lives so bad that we'll pray for the things to be gone rather than focusing about what was wrong that caused them to begin with? We need God to be with us, to lead us, to help us, and to guide us. When our hearts will start hurting, we need to be sincere and ask God to trust us. Think about this in your life. The things we're going through, there is a purpose behind it. God loves us. He would never put us through something if there wasn't a master plan. 
And his plans are to make us better. Do we have to suffer to get there? Yeah, sometimes. But wake up before it's too late. He'll stop at any time that you get ready for him to. And if you just turn your life over and get it straight, trust him, he'll change things. But you've got to be able to change for the change that he's going to bring his way. You've got to be ready for that. So pray about it. Let God bless you. Father, we thank you for your wonderful love and mercy. We thank you because you show us illustrations like this in the Bible that can help us to be better. And we pray they are. Help us to recognize our sin before it's too late. Draw us closer to you. Keep us safe. Minister to us and minister through us. But most of all, God, hold our hand. No matter what we face, walk with us. Help us to be compassionate to others, God, because we don't know why they're going through what they're going through. We're not judges. We're just supposed to be good Christians that are compassionate and loving. So strengthen us and help us and comfort us. We sure love you in Jesus' name. Amen.